You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Um, you don't realise you've changed until you go on tour, until you take your first shot, until you take your first target out and you think, fucking hell, this is it. I'm a sniper. I get upset. She's... Yeah, she's... Um, not normal. She's something else. She's beyond... She goes beyond her remit of a wife. Beyond it. To help me. I think about suicide all the time. All the time. I wake up in the morning thinking about it. And I think the reason... There's a few reasons why I've never gone through with it. One, because my wife. Second, because of my dog. And thirdly, somebody's got to find me. And if somebody finds me, I've infected them with my misery. Even when I'm gone, somebody else is suffering because they need to find me. I'm not crazy, right? I'm not crazy. But I have a voice in my head that says I'm vile. And it's not my own voice, it's somebody else. On my right side, it's constantly there all the time. I say to my therapist who I see, I say, I feel sad. So, so sad. And I can't, I can't shift it. I can't shift this sadness. I can't, I can't find an end to it, really. And I miss, I miss me. I missed who I was. And I put one round in, cocked it, uh, put it in my mouth. And I remember his slime was coming out and I was just... Boom, we're on. Yeah. Today's guest, we've got Craig Harrison. How, How are you, doing? Craig? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. I watched your story on Lad Bible. Yeah, phenomenal. Um, the power in it from being a sniper. You've done four tours. The stresses of your life, you've 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 put on the line, like what you're going through, what you're battling, not just when you were in the British Army, but what you had to battle after it. Um, I was blown away by it. That's why I've been trying to get you on for months. Um, but first and foremost, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You know, as I said, like still vertical, so <laughs> still pushing forward. Yeah, you're looking well. Yeah, I feel okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did a good set gym session today. He says. Yeah. yeah four o'clock. Four a.m. Every day. That's dedication. Yeah. Bar weekends. That's time for the wife. <laughs> yeah, a bit of family time. Yeah. I always go back to the start of my guest, Craig. Where you grew up? And how it all began? Um, I born in Cheltenham, uh, in the Cotswolds area, the Malvins. Um, just riding horses. I was just dedicated to horses. You know, my mum got me a horse. I had a good childhood. It wasn't bad. And uh, from there, my mum sort of grew me to join the army because there was nothing in Cheltenham. I think it was old people go to die, you know. And uh, so if I'd have stayed there, I would have grown old and died in Cheltenham. Yeah. So my brother joined the army first and then I joined the Household Cavalry. I wanted to be a farrier. My granddad always told me, get a trade, get a trade. And I thought, yeah, I'd be a farrier, you know, because obviously the farrier that used to come f- um, to shoe my horses when I was younger, um, he seemed to be minted, you know, and I thought, yeah, bit of money in the back pocket, good trade. I joined the House of Recovery, joined the Army, and then uh, become a farrier. And what was school like, Craig? Yeah, I was a bit of a loner at school. I had one friend, uh, and, and he was my cousin. Uh, Tom, he was a year older than me, but um, I didn't do too well at school at all. So I used to bunk off all the time, and uh, just, what was the point? You know, I spent more time in the woods than I did actually at school, but left with nothing, you know, and a bit of a loner, got picked on really um, for my size, my big feet, my big ears, sort of grew into them now, I think. But um, yeah, quite, quite quiet school yeah didn't get into much trouble did that affect you growing up then getting the bullying um 
yeah, really, because I was worried about going out, you know, going downtown. And mum says, God, go downtown, do this for me. And I didn't want to do it because where I lived, it was gangs of lads, you know, and they always used to pick. And I can remember the gang now quite clearly in my head, you know, and uh, I got my own back. So Eventually? Yeah. Did, was that a relief for you? Was that a sense of like, revenge? Um, yeah. Yeah, I remember during the army, coming home on my first leave and seeing him in McDonald's. And uh, I told my mate, Tom, I said, just stand by the door. I took the boom handle off this boom mop and uh, I went to town. Yeah, and they shut McDonald's down for two days. Yeah, I got my own back. Self-satisfaction. Was that years and years playing in your mind to get revenge because Not of really. the torment you went through? Or was it just one of those things that Sp happened? Spur the moment, mm -hmm. you know. I saw him and I thought, fuck this, I'm going to go for it. And just years and years of just being picked on, getting bullied. I thought, oh, enough's enough. This is what I'm going to do. So I did it. Yeah. How was that feeling after it? Euphoria. Rush. You know, that I, I felt... You feel indestructible after a while. You think, yes, but I think this is what the army breeds into you. You know, they breed, they breed that, they knock that civilian out of you and build you into a man. And that's why my first leave, I came back as a man and I thought, no, I'm not having this no more. If I need to progress in the army, I need to be a man. And the opportunity came, it was there and I took it and I ran with it. What was the age did you join there? Was it 16? 16 years old, yeah. So still like a young boy. Yeah, I did the guards yeah. depot um, down in Purbright. And it was the guards depot. Not now, it's an all arms place. But um, and because the household cavalry is part of the um, household division uh, with the guards, you you have to do your training with them. And um, I, there was only two household cavalry lads in my platoon. And they used to take the piss out of us all the time, call us horse shaggers and fucking cab this because they were the house, because they were the guards, you know. And uh, but I think it made me a better person to strive to be better. What was it like joining for the f the first time, like being away from home? Were you away from home at sixteen? Sixteen, yeah. Um, I think my mum sort of like me put me in the line to join the army at an early age from about 10 years old, I think. So I was doing my washing, doing my ironing, doing everything, chores and everything. So she was building me up to it. So leaving home was, it, it didn't bother me. It didn't bother me. It was nice to get out of the house really. And as soon as you get shouted at, you think, fucking hell, this is it. This is it. I never look back. It's like my wife told me, she goes, you never complain. You never complain. You're up early in the mornings, you train, you go to work for nine hours, you do this, you do that. You never complain about doing it. And I never complained about joining the army. One of the best things I've ever done. You've done four tours? Um, I've done, well, 10 altogether. What? Yeah, I've done um, three Bosnia, two Kosovo, uh, three Iraq and two Afghan. Mm. That's a lot of tours. Yeah, it is, yeah. So see, when you were going through, 16, 17, 18, did you have a plan what route you wanted to go down as a sniper or were you just... No, I would ju join the army to be a farrier. Mm -hmm. That was it. But in them days when I joined in the 90s, it was like the forge was big handlebar tashes, big guys hitting metal on a foot, on an anvil and your face had to fit. And I was a bit dyslexic as well, you know. So <clears throat> when I got an opportunity to do a pre-assessment in the forge, my... Homework at night was more illustrated than writing and it wasn't good enough for them. And plus my face didn't fit. So I didn't manage to get in the forward show. <clears throat> How did you end up being a sniper then? Because people say that you're one of the best snipers ever. How do you think with that tagline? How do you feel that? When I was younger, I used to do triathlons. Mm -hmm. So it's running, swimming, riding and shooting, you know, in a, over a weekend. Mm -hmm. So my shooting skills were, I was all right. Yeah, with an yeah. air rifle. And um, how did I become a sniper is the household cavalry was nothing to do with snipering. It's all to do with reconnaissance, moving forward, gathering information of the enemy, distracting back. You know, we would go for the furthest from us would be special forces. And then it'd be in the household cavalry. And then it'd be the rest of the army, you know. And um, 
and suddenly an opportunity came up where snipers were allowed in the House or Cavalry. So I thought, this is what I want to do. I want, I want to go at it. I want to have a go. And I excelled. Yeah, it was like, because I was a country boy anyway, and I spent most of my time wagging off school in the countryside, I understood it. You know, I understood about backdrops, aerial drop, front drops, camouflage and concealment, shape, silhouette, shine, and stuff like that. And... Yeah, I excelled. How do snipers get treated with other regiments? Because I know other regiments fight with each other and stuff like that, but how do snipers get treated? Because it's quite a lonely job. I know there's, when, if you're out and doing a job with a sniper, there's, there's both of you, is that correct? Yeah, there's two, yeah. So how do you get treated? Because it's not as if are you with another battalion, or how does it work? Uh, you stay with your regiment, mm -hmm. and uh, when you go on tour, if they're short of snipers, another regiment um, or a troop or something, you end up being attached to them but you get treated like uh, tramps of the army. Do because, you? Yeah, because you're scruffy. <clears throat> you know, you're scruffy, you're, you're gillied up, you, you spend your time with your number two, who's my one of my best friends still now, you know, and you end up having that companionship. You don't want to go away talking or stuff like that. You just want to stay in your little unit, mm -hmm. you know. I think that, I think you end up doing that naturally. Instead of mingling, you end up being on your own naturally because not because you're a sniper, because you get taught it, you know? Did you used to do a bit of street fighting back in the day, early years? Yeah, when I was at Nicebridge, yeah, down in Houston it was. There's a gym down there. I don't think it's there anymore. Yeah, I, I met a guy who said, you're interested in doing, making some money? And I said, yeah, I'm interested. And he said, it's all to do with fighting. And the first time I went down there, I thought it was a bit out of my league, you know. And uh, you end up having three fights a night. You could win up to about 300 to 600 quid a fight. Uh, it depends who's booking or, um, betting on you. But uh, the idea is always lose a fight. Never win all your fights. Because then the uh, people won't take you outside and do you over. They won't think you're a cocky fucker. Mm -hmm. So there's a way of doing it and making money. Did the army training help you with the fighting? Uh, or was that just a release for you? Is it more of a release? More, I had a lot of, lot of anger when I was younger. My grandfather died when I was young, and he was like a father figure to me. And I think that all bottled up inside me, you know. And I had a sheet of ice, and all this anger and anxiety and stress was holding this ice wall, you know. And then um, obviously it crumbled years on and the situation we're in now in my life yeah what's training like for a sniper it's hard Is it's, that? yeah it's hard you have to do it's nine weeks altogether um i think it's extended now i'm not quite sure but in my my it was nine and a half weeks nine weeks and you do a shooting phase first anyone can shoot a rifle you know i could give you a rifle now with a scope on it i can lay you down and go right over there put this on your scope and you'll hit it. It, it that's the easy bit the hard bit is the snipering bit the camouflage and concealment reading a map sketching observing staying still that's the hardest bit of being a sniper you know of, of, of the whole course and a lot of people pass the shooting and fail on the sniper bit to become a sniper but when you pass the shooting you're a sharpshooter so you can go back to the regiment as a sharpshooter but to pass the sniper phase is a, an extra tick in your box. Yeah. What sort of targets do you hit when you're training? We used to call them Hun's heads. They look like uh, little diddy heads, A4 size, a bit of paper to give people a rough idea. Yeah, and I think my last um, my last test that I did was I had a radio on and I was all gillied up in this bush and, I st and you had to stay there for 24 hours. And within that 24 hours, a target will pop up and then you'll get a countdown in your ear. But it could be 24 hours, it could be 19 hours, it could be 18 hours, it could be an hour, half an hour, you know. And uh, suddenly you're, you're, you're nodding dog because you've been there for so long looking for the scope and you hear five, four, three, two, one, target down. And you're like that. What the? Have I... I didn't see it. I didn't see it. But luckily, I, I saw mine. I saw mine. And it, it's got a letter on it. And it have like um, a fluorescent K on it on a white background. 
and you've got to give that information back because being a sniper people have got this mentality in the head of being a sniper you get a gun you go out and kill people you're like an assassin you just go out and do the job it's not the first job of a sniper is to gather lifetime information of the battlefield so it's your job to go out there get information and then bring that information back and once that information's back and they can work it out what to do then you go and take the target out you yeah. know and that's the whole idea so see when you're doing the training and you, so you had to stay up for like 24 hours was there any times you thought to yourself fuck this this is a bit extreme no did you just love it and loved that it. was your passion yeah loved it absolutely loved it yeah yeah because i see when you're speaking about it how like yeah i feel like you feel alive oh, it gives me good uh, it just, <laughs> just yeah um it's funny enough my, my daughter's getting married um in december you're not going to get your sniper out are you? yeah, <laughs> <For them. laughs> yeah. um and my wife was going through some photos yeah. and uh, i found some photos of when i did my sniper's course mm -hmm. and it brought about a lot of memories yeah. a lot of memories and i thought and it's funny enough because every weekend we had off i would go back home and then I'll go into camp, into the tailor shop, and I'll be making modifications to my ghillie suit, putting pads on my trousers, trying to make myself better. You know, where lads were just relaxed, I was still, you know, doing stuff to to strive to be better. Mm -hmm. Did you see changes in yourself going through the training? Did you changes like to be drilled into that person that like, don't sleep, look for targets, noises, whatever it is you do for training? Did, did you totally start seeing changes in yourself or did you just become so consumed with what you're being taught and you don't really realise that you were changing? Um, you don't realise you've changed until you go on tour, until you take your first shot, until you take your first target out and you think fucking hell this is it i'm a sniper this is what it's doing people do sniper courses and never fire a shot in their whole career you know and some people go on tour like the marines they've got all the powers all the rifles they go on tour and their snipers will have you know one hell of a tour you know good or bad but um i think you notice the change when you take your first shot yeah yeah you and then you become a bit of a loner you do become a bit of a loner they say um you do courses in the army and you become trades like you do your crew commanders and you have a trade and then you do your snipers course and that's a trade but now i'm a big believer in saying that the snipers wasn't a trade it was a curse now now looking back at it yeah you know. so see when you're going through training and you get called up for your first mission what do you call it a job how is it you call yeah, it yeah a mission, a mission. mission yeah. so when you get called up for your first mission what's the feeling like have you been trained that much that it becomes normal is there still nerves there that you're thinking okay it's game time to after you take your first shot and you took your first target out and no one's tapping you on the shoulder going you just um, killed someone can I have a quick word with you now how did this happen no one's going to question it you know because you're doing your job you're doing what you're being paid for um, so after that, it gets, when you get your next mission, you're like, ah, right, I'm up for this now. I'm up for this. I know I can do it. I know this, what I'd done the first time, you know, because I can remember it clear as day in my head, the first mission I went on, you know, and then the second mission becomes second nature, third mission, fourth mission, fifth mission. It's good to be scared. It's good to be nervous. Because if you're not nervous or scared, you make stupid mistakes. You know, you become more, you, you become more in tune to your surroundings. If you got cocky with it, you're going to make mistakes. That's what I believe. How much training did you do before you went on your first mission? You do, um, well, you do six months low level training in England. Mm -hmm. And then as a sniper, you do extra training because you have to pass field firing tests to make sure that you're up for the, the task what's the psychology the psychology side of things before you go on a first mission is a lot there or is it just training to get targets training to get targets um and you get talked to after so they ask you because it's called trim a trauma or something they call it and each mission you go on you're meant to get trimmed when you come off your mission so 
it's meant to lower down PTSD, you know, but it doesn't happen all the time. Mm -hmm. And some regiments are better than others. When you get called up for your first mission, what, where did you end up? In Iraq, in the desert. What was that feeling for you? We were, yeah, we were in a MOG, which is a moving, um, sort of like moving vehicles around. And we're moving around the desert. And they was, every time we stopped for a long period of time, you, we were 100 miles away from anywhere. We're in the Maysan Desert in Iraq, miles from, 100 miles away from anywhere. And um, we would get artillery mortared, and then we'll have to move somewhere else mortared. And we noticed that a motorbike was following us. Every time we went somewhere, a motorbike would follow us. And uh, we, we um, realised that this motorbike was dicking us. He was giving information coordinates to where we were so the artillery can be bopped in on us so i got the green light to take this guy out he's 675 yards away um it's quite hard in the heat because you ever see the films where you see somebody in the desert walking towards you they look really tall mm -hmm. they look really high it's because that's because of the heat shimmer you know and there's there's like four to five different heat shimmers that you can get you know and so you have to work that out so you have to shoot low and uh, yeah, I, I, I shot the guy. And how long did you have to wait to, for your target? Like, did, not, I don't know, some d times you've went days, but do you just set up and then look for the target and then shoot? Or does it take hours? And I took myself away from the uh, the patrol itself. So he just thought he was looking at the patrol and I could definitely, I could PID him. There's no point. He could just be a, a, like a, a guy who's interested in vehicles. I had to PID him. He had a radio on him. You know, and he had a, an AK-47 strapped to his motorbike. So he had all the indicators that he was dicking us. So, and I took myself away a few hours. And he came into view because we guarantee as soon as we stop, we've got artillery, you know, and he came into view and I, and I took him out. And what was that feeling for you for like the hours leading up to it? Was it nerves or were you just cold, calm and ready to do your job? Cool. Yeah, it was weird, weird feeling. You know, it was more afterwards when you sit on your, when you sit there with the lads, you become quiet. And like I said before, you're, you, you're expecting that tap on the shoulder. You feel in trouble because you, what you've just done, you know, mm -hmm. it's unnatural to do that sort of thing, but you're in the army and that's what the army's all about. It's all about, you know, doing the tours, standing up for what you feel is right, doing your job. You know, and that's what I'd done. But you, I always expected that tap on the shoulder. But the taps on the shoulder I got were, you know, well done. You're doing all right. Good job. Yeah, good so job. So see when you like killed the the, the target, is that a, like what's that feeling then? Is it like an adrenaline feeling like I've done a good job, I'm doing the right thing, or is that just move on to the next? It's your job at the end of the day. It's but, your job. Yeah. yeah. But the hardest bit was I had to go up to that target and PID him. So it wasn't the fact of just taking the shot and walking away and let somebody else deal with it. I dealt with it myself as well. So I went up to the target and gave him information on I took him, I took maps off him, I took the radio off him, took his AK off him. His motorbike was still revving like fuck. The, the throttle was caught in the sand. So the motorbike was like really revving, the back wheel was going lunatic. And yeah, he was, he passed away. Is that the hardest thing? Like, is that harder than killing a person to actually seeing them dead? Yeah, because you've done that. You've done that. And you're still rushing after it. You're still getting that bit of a, you know, and like I said before, it's when you slow down. And it's when you've got a bit of downtime and you're expecting that look over the shoulder, a tap on the shoulder. But after a, few, after a week, it lasted. That's how long it lasted, a week. And after a week, it sort of, dissipated and went away and the next mission came along and you feel right because I've done my first mission well, second mission's going to be okay. I'm not going to get a tap on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. you know? So see when you're going through that, like those motions and everything, like, do you get time to, okay, you take a few days off or is it just straight back into the job? Straight back in, yeah. People always think that when you go on tour, it's like you're full on. Yeah, sometimes you're full on. Mm. But majority of the time, it's more downtime and you go on patrols and you have a mission and you have some downtime because the downtime is important. You know, you need to have that downtime to 
get your thoughts together. Yeah. If you're just getting smashed all the time, you're going to make stupid mistakes and lives are going to get lost, you know. So see when you're on tour, and when you, if you kill someone, then you have to go up and look at the body. Because you're trained as a sniper, do you ever get paranoid that there's other snipers actually oh, looking yeah. for you as a target? Yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. When I, when I broke the world record, I didn't know I broke the world record at the time. And then I got deployed onto a ridgeline uh, to look into this village. And because I had done so much devastation on that tour, they sent uh, an out-of-season fighter. Now, an out-of-season fighter is not an Afghan guy. Um, it could be a Chechen, it could have been a Russian, it could have been anything, you know, a foreigner sniper to hunt me down. So every time I got deployed somewhere, there was somebody trying to find me. So that was... So you had, like, the, a wanted yeah. like a target on your yeah. head like, because you were making waves of this guy's killing all the other people's... That was correct, yeah. How does that make you feel back? Does that is, scared? Is constant? Yeah, constantly looking over your shoulder. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh funny enough, I still look over my shoulder now. You know, I'm still wary of what's going on around me. It's like we said earlier, it's probably the training you've had. Yeah. It probably is. Yeah. But I'm very aware of my surroundings. Yeah, because I picked up from the train station, you says, let's just stop here because there was, there was two people people behind you, that noise and stuff. But noise and people people just walk so close up behind you and it makes me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, so let, let's just stop here. Have you ever said to anyone, look, back off? No. 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 Um I have to say I've I've learned now to say I'm stopping. Mm -hmm. because sometimes I just stop and my wife will just fuck off into the <laughs> distance, you know, and she she's talking and then, and then she would stop yeah. and she'll go, great, great, bro. And I'm, I'm back there somewhere yeah. waiting for people yeah. to pass. I'm fucking laughing, but I can understand the all this, that you've actually went through, yeah. like what you've done. Like, I know a lot of people, like, as a job, and you're, you're helping save troops, your own um, troops to then obviously go on and whatever targets you're doing, whatever jobs you're doing. So when you started moving through and then does it become, like you says, it becomes easier then to then kill people and do the missions without, it's just normal? Yeah, I think um, killing's always the second priority, hmm. you know, um, like I said before, but um, it, d it does become easier. You become quite numb to it, you know, and then... Um, then you're a sniper, aren't you? you yeah. Know, and that's what it's about. What's the longest you've stayed on a job to Ten days. a target? Ten days. Without moving? Without moving. On and this on this ridge line, yeah. And how do you do the toilet and stuff? I just, you, uh, I dug a trough between my legs with my um, feet, um, end up peeing, um, just peeing there, or, or peeing the con like the, you know, the um, big containers you get the hand sanitizer in, you end up peeing in them. You get together, they can fold up. You end up shitting in a uh, little Tupperware tub, so you're not leaving any ground sign behind. Yeah. Is that in your mind as well? Because can you leave like DNA and stuff if somebody knows where you've made your kill? Can other um, intelligence gather your DNA and, and know who you are then? Yeah, it's too, but is the that idea, cross the, your mind? Is that not an issue? The idea is that, yeah, it's a massive issue because if I was tracking somebody and I found a fag, but or I found their shit, or I found their piss, I can say, yeah, he's hydrated, so I know he's got water. Or, yeah, fucking hell, it looks like LucasAid, so I know he's dehydrated too much, he can't have much water left. Or you look at their shit, and you think, right, he's eating well, because the shit looks like that. Or if his shit's like got diarrhea, you know he's got DMV, or he's dehydrated still. You know, there's certain DNA in cigarette butts, you can take DNA off that and go back. And realised, yeah, that's still warm. Yeah, he hasn't been here long. What cigarette make is it? Oh, that's an English make. You know, it, there's loads of information that you can get from that. So the idea is, is take everything away with you. So you get taught that with yeah. shit, pish, yep. cigarettes. Yep. Like. Yeah, you call, you call it an ageing pit. And what you do, you get like, um, like, um, like four foot by four foot square and you put grids in it. Mm -hmm. And in that grid, you put um, an apple core. And that one grid will become one day. And each day you move it. You keep moving it and moving it and moving it until it comes to the last grid, which would be two weeks or a week, and see how moldy and rotten it is. But you're seeing the, the transformation 
of that apple core. And it's called an aging pit or an aging grid, and that's what they do as well. Do it with cigarette butts as well because they fade after a while. And you, you sort of like get tuned into that. You go, yeah, that's about a week old, that. Oh, that's two days old. So somebody's been here two days ago. I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be. I'm going to move somewhere else because there's a cigarette butt there. So there's inhabitants. So you move somewhere else. That's mad. You see it in the films that like you see them picking up cigarettes, are touching like the urine and stuff, and you think that's just a bit far fetched. But that yeah. happens, yeah. Yeah, real. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Shit, man. Some yeah. intelligence to go through to be learning stuff like that. Oh yeah. You yeah. See, did you ever turn down a job, Craig? No. You can't turn down jobs in the army. No, that's refusing as a soldier. You know, you got to do what you got to do. And how do you get that? Do you go, right, this is, where, when do you get the information, the intelligence to where you're going? Do you, on the day or do you get Yeah, on the day. So you'll have, a, you'll have an old group um, where everyone goes into this old group and then they go, right, yeah, we need snipers on this. We need overwatch for this. We need this. We need this. Yeah, we need heavy armaments. We need artillery support. You know, and then they, they would go through your role as a sniper. They said, right, you'll go in before everyone else. You'll go on this hill. You'll observe any movement, any enemy movement at all. Let us know if there's any enemy movement. If there's not, then the task will go forward. But if there's enemy movement there, the t so it all relies on you in a way. So see the 10 days you were on a mission. Did you sleep? You cut nap for the day. How, yeah. and like what like a bust of 20 minutes 20, 20, 20 minutes 20 minute cat nap because I have number two with me and he would cat nap as well he would stay awake I would cat nap just because he had a, usually the number two um, would have a spotting scope out but on this occasion we both had rifles out so if one of us could take the shot one of us could take the shot because we're the, it's usually number two is the better the, the better at doing the observing better at calculations and number one is the beauty of the better shot but me and my mate were about as, were about as equal so we just took it in turns mm -hmm. so when did you because you got the world's longest sniper kill yeah and it was like 1.6 miles or something yeah 2475 meters and yeah. your, your your gun that you were using the rifle could only go 600 meters is that uh, correct 1500 meters 1500 meters yeah, like. yeah. so how do you get a target from over a mile away, how does how do you judge that with like wind and the climate? How many things do you judge? Climate, atmosphere, barometric pressure, everything, wind. But this day was perfect. You know, like um, in winter when you wake up, like today, perfect blue sky, no wind, cold, but it's perfect. That was the day that. Because I took the shot, I was only wearing a t-shirt. But not many people know I was stood up when I'd done the shot. I wasn't lying down. I was stood up against the wall when I took the shot. And it took me nine shots to get there in the morning. Um, to Because they were, we were getting dicked. Do you want to know the story? Yeah. Do you want to know the story? Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, there was an op going in, an operation going in, where the Afghan army mixed with British troops were going into this village to um, clear this village out for the Taliban. And it was my job as uh, Maverick 4-1 to um, give overwatch. And I had four other vehicles with me, my lads in there. So I had about 12 guys with me. And it was our job to give overwatch. But I could see all the Taliban in this village where I was. I could see them all. I can see them queuing up, waiting to attack this patrol coming in. And I informed them that you got a, you, you're going to get hit in a minute, and you have a kill zone. Now this kill zone is where it's easy for to get killed, and it's a box, usually a box. And they walk into that kill zone, and the Taliban would open up. There'd be no cover, no shelter, no nothing, and you just get massacred. I had with me an interpreter who had an ICOM, and an ICOM is a radio that um, is tuned into the Taliban frequency. So you can hear them talking to each other. And I was going, what they say now? What they say now? They go, yeah, they can see the patrol. They're walking up to the kill zone. Da, 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 da. And then it opened up. And then in the distance, I saw a glint. I thought, what the fuck's that? So I got my spotting scope out, which is more magnified um, than my, my scope and my rifle. I looked up. And I could see a guy with a radio 
um, because I can see the antenna was glinting off the sun and uh, next to a compound. And I thought, right, I'm going to have this fucker. So I fucking loaded up and I shot and I was really low. And I try to laser it through laser binos because then it comes up the distance so I can do the calculations. But it just kept coming up lines. So I knew it was over the range of the laser binos and out of the range of my rifle. So what I did is bracket. Now bracketing is when you fire the first shot and you know where it's landed and you just lift the rifle up a bit and you fire again, you fire again, you keep going. And it took me nine shots and I hit the compound wall and, and you could see the dust in the compound wall. Next thing I knew, the interpreter said to me, um, he said they're on their own. And he said, I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, the person you've just shot at He's got his head down and he's gone blind. So the inter Taliban now can't see the patrol coming in. So they're fighting blind. So uh, then I decided to move my vehicles into the kill zone itself to get cover and fire for the patrol to move back so they can move back all their injured and wounded. And um, I started taking out Taliban in the village itself. And I noticed in the corner of my eye there was um, a Taliban stood next to a, a water pump. And I thought, was he? and I was looking, like looking over my shoulder and I was going, what the fuck's he doing there? And I thought, they're going to flank us. He's found where I was, because I was quite exposed on top of this hillside. They found out where I was and they're going to come round and flank us. Now, they had a no, they had some nomads behind me and I looked, they're fucked off. They're gone. They're in the distance on their camels going. Uh, uh, cause, <laughs> and I thought, I thought something's going on here. You know, they, they've sent something. They left everything, boarding kettles, a little old granny. They left her behind. She was just sat on this little stone. And um, so I turned around and I, I wasted this guy. And because I thought he was a marker, but he wasn't what he had done. He had knocked the water pump head off. He had flooded all the irrigation fields. So now my vehicles were just wheel spinning in the mud. They were stuck. And next thing I knew, I saw splashes coming up. And I thought, where's it? And I could see all my lads hitting the ground for cover. And the vehicles were getting pepper sprayed, everything. And I checked all the points where I engaged the enemy. I checked them all. I was checking them, checking them. And I thought, I can't see anything. The only place I didn't check is where... That compound was, and I checked, and it was two Taliban up there. And I knew that I had shot there in the morning. This lasted for about three hours, this, this engagement. And um, so I thought, well, I, I need to do this because my men are going to get killed. So I fired my first shot, and it missed. I saw it splash uh, just in front, and I saw one guy stand up and as he stood up I fired again and the bullet takes it took six seconds to fly there so I'm firing I'm going one two three, six and I the guy went down and I hit him here and then the second guy was still firing he stood up I fired my third shot and as I fired my third shot I moved my rifle across and fired another shot so this time I got two bullets in the air at the same time. One at three seconds, one at six seconds. Third one missed, fourth one hit him. And it hit him um, in the side here. And the reason why we knew where we hit him is because we wanted to get the weapon off him. Because if we don't carry the, uh, get the weapon, it gets recycled back into the Taliban. But the weapon will already gone. And it was just these guys. So seeing when you shoot from that distance, is, it, is the power still as strong no. from... The bullets slowed down to about 40. We worked it out um, to about 40 miles an hour. So if they had body armor on, it would just go and do. But yeah. it didn't. It, it, it actually penetrated them. And I suppose slow has got to be worse, hasn't it, really, getting shot? Because that cavity's got open slower as well. So. Yeah. Did you not have to like, bend the, the bullet from higher up to come down as well or something? No, I had a quite clear shot yeah. from where I was. If There's a picture of me actually taking the shot and my gunner took it and from where I'm standing it looks like I'm shooting like this mm -hmm. but I'm not I'm, I've had a clear view from where he was and then but you got to think over a thousand yards the spin of the world 
the Coriolis effect of the world takes effect of that bullet as well, you know. So wherever you're facing in the world, you've got to take into consideration where that bullet's going. And I say to this day now, it's a, it was a fluke to this day now. Do you think that's discrediting yourself for the, 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 for the knowledge and everything that you've achieved? Not really. I try to... I try to save 12 guys and get them out of the shit. And I knew, I didn't even know the distance to what I was firing. And in the fact, an Apache came up behind me and he hovered up and I saw the pilot and I just went like that. And he, he, he lasered it because I wanted to see, mm. I didn't want to see, but I wanted to know if there's any more enemy in the area. And he, you know, and they flew over and that's how he got GPSed for that thing and you know and you got medals and stuff for that you got medals that's when you found out it was the longest uh, sniper kill yeah um, I did my medals parade when we came back off tour mm. I did my medals parade and um, my men had seen the most action on that tour um, so we had the most stories so they bring a, a, like a reporter in and it gets censored. So it go to London District Media Ops and it will get censored saying you can't put that, can't put, put that. Yeah, you can put that in the paper now. But it never got censored. And um, my name was plastered all over the papers. And that's when I started getting death threats. And that's when we went into hiding for three years. So you had to go into like, protection? It wasn't. We had police protection <clears throat> for the first year and then we moved to America. Because they had printed your name? Yeah, they <clears throat> wanted to cut my head off. Because I found out the... Two guys that I killed were Taliban leaders. Two Taliban leaders who were orchestrating the attack from where they were. And then, so what happens then with your life for that you become a wanted man from some of the ruth most ruthless people on this planet? Destroys it. Fucking destroys it. Where you have to leave the country, you, you leave everything behind. You, my wife, especially, she really suffered. You know, everyone was going to me, enjoy it, enjoy the moment, enjoy the moment. As soon as I opened the paper, it was just about me. It was nothing about my lads or what they've been through, which they deserve the credibility as well, because it's not a one-man army, you know. I had 16 guys with me, you know. I did that tour with 16 guys. I came back with six guys, original guys, on that tour. We got hit hard. And um, so it's to do with their credibility as well. And it was all about me all about me and my wife goes i got a funny feeling about this greg i got a really funny feeling about this and everyone's going no let him enjoy it well done let him enjoy this let him enjoy that and uh, she was fucking right she was yeah she was right so how did you know that you were a wanted man the fact that he got printed in the paper which i still got the paper clippings now um which they wanted to kidnap a muslim soldier and also behead me for what i achieved in in afghan he was all plastered in the papers as well where did, when you went to america where, where did you stay well we stayed just in uh, in washington down south from washington and an yeah. army base no no we just had a new life over there Shit. just makes you question everything as well like everything you do did you feel safe though in america we did yeah yeah it was all right it was all right. We want to come back because right. Trump renew, won't renew my visa because mm -hmm. Trump's new policy, make America great again. So he kicked my wife out first and he kicked me out. <laughs> so we, and then we came back to England and then because we've been out of the country for three years, mm -hmm. no credit history, no this. I, I couldn't get a car, I couldn't get a phone, I couldn't get a, a loan, I couldn't get a mortgage or anything because the army had fucked it all up for me. So everything that you've done for your country, man, risking your life, taking other people's lives to then help your, your brothers to then being fucked over, basically? Massively. Massively. Like I said before, you know, 23 years, half an hour to get kicked out. And then coming back, you've no credit, no nothing. Like, that's hard. How hard is it as well, like, losing your brothers, like being on tour, 16 years and only six come back? How hard is that when you lose men? I'd imagine, is that the more tough, is that the toughest thing over the job? Yeah, yeah, because you feel responsible. Because prior going on tour, you know, you do exercises and you practice six months before going on tour. You're training for six months, doing low-level training. So when one incident where I was on top of a hill, another vehicle there, my mate, and I told him, I said, right, you need to go down. I said, no, wait there, I'll do that. 
you wait here. And as I rolled off, I stopped and goes, no, nah, change my mind, you go. Hit a fucking IED. Driver lost both his legs. Um, Jonesy did his ankle in. Fucking gunner went deaf, fell off the back. Hit a, um, like a 20 kilo HMA, like homemade explosive. And that's the hardest stuff to deal with. It is because you think, why did I, why didn't I go? Why didn't I go? You know what I mean? Why did I put him there? Why did I put that guy there? Why didn't I go there? You want to be there all the time. You want to be in the front of it because you don't want your men to get hurt. You know, that's a, that's a big thing. So you're willing to die for your troops any day, any time? Sounds a bit cliche, doesn't it? But yeah, yeah, I suppose. And you get annoyed at that because you're doing a job, but yet when you lose troops, you feel as if you're to blame. That's a big burden to keep on your, your heart, but is it not? Big. Yeah. I wear it. I wear it. So, see, how many jobs did you do? Do you count? No. No? Nah? No. But it's fucking, it's a tough job, man. It's tough what you've done and what you've went through and everything that you've done. Like, I suppose from either from being special forces, I think a sniper is one of the, as well as being a tough job because they get used and abused all the time. You know, they are rushed off their feet. And when you go on tour, you, you do get a bit raped as a sniper. Is that what you feel now? Yeah. Yeah, you did, yeah. Not at the time, though? Not at the time. You're just doing your job. You're there. you got to do it. Makes time go quicker as well. Yeah. You know, because you just want the tour to finish. You want to come back to your wife. When did How far were you in doing your, your, your job when you met your missus? Um, my second tour of Iraq. When I met her, just came back from my first tour, and uh, I met her in Bedford, and um, I get upset. She's, yeah, she's um, not normal. She's something else. She's beyond. She goes beyond her remit of a wife, beyond it to help me. Kindest woman in the world. Do you feel as if that she, you, that she didn't realise what she was getting into with being with somebody who was in the British Army? That's true, yeah. She just thought soldiers are soldiers. You know, everyone hears about soldiers on the piss and razzing it up. And she thought that stigma sticks. But then she realised how professional and how close we all are and what it means to be a soldier. You know, and how proud we are as a lower rank to a senior rank. You know, you, you, you do get proud to being a soldier. And that's, so people don't see that. People don't see that. How long are you away for your wife and stuff at a time? Nine months to six months. All depends on the tour. Yeah, it's a long time, especially for somebody to wait for you as well and somebody to have your back. Like that shows that we spoke earlier and you say it's like a, a gift from God, basically. Like, would you, do you think you would still be here, Craig, if you never had your missus? No. No, I, I think about suicide all the time, all the time. I wake up in the morning thinking about it. And I think the reason, there's a few reasons why I've never gone through with it. One, because my wife. Second, because my dog. And thirdly, somebody's got to find me. And if somebody finds me, I've infected them with my misery. Even when I'm gone, somebody else is suffering because they need to find me. Yeah, that's a, that's a heavy stuff, that like Craig, man. Yeah. Like, do you not sleep well? Um, drugs. All to do with drugs. Drugs make me sleep. I take it, and we, and within half an hour, I'm out. And if I don't take it, um, I'm walking around the house, wandering, checking the curtains, checking the windows, check the front door. So many times. You know, look, peering, just, I don't sit down. And then me and my wife don't sleep together. We sleep in separate beds because I have really bad night terrors. I end up hitting her or uh, pushing her out of the bed or kicking her. So she's best off sleeping on her own. But it's not, we still love each other as well at time, you know, still have mm -hmm. our time together. That's a strong woman, but to be accepting all that, it just shows you like, true love there, that she's accepted who you are, what you've done, and 
of what you're trying to achieve. But like I say, your Lad Bible interview will change lives. This interview will change lives. Like the strength to be still here, to carry on, that like, shows you your kind of character. You're clearly a fighter, which is inspirational. That like, nobody realizes the depths of what it's like to be in the British Army or any army, whatever mm. it is. That like, it's not just your own sacrifices mentally, but it's the other people around you who are also sacrificing, like losing brothers, lose, even people losing relationships, losing their life. Like it's mad to what actually goes on and you probably not, not even touched the surface of what you've actually went through but so see when you're trying to get asleep and stuff you said you need to listen to music as well yeah I, I'm not crazy right? I'm yeah, not yeah, crazy yeah. but I have a voice in my head that says I'm vile and it's not my own voice it's somebody else on my right side it's constantly there all the time now I got blown up on tour. I got shot in the helmet or on my right side. So I don't know if that's something to do with it or anything. I don't know. But this voice, all it says is that I'm vile. That's all it says. You're vile, you're vile, you're vile. And then the medication that I'm on dulls it down. But it's still there, you know. And some days you end up believing it. And you become depressed, you become down. I call it being sad. I say to my therapist who I see, I say, I feel sad. So, so sad. And I can't and I can't shift it. I can't shift this sadness. I can't I can't find an end to it, really. And I miss I miss me. I miss who I was. I miss the laughing, I miss the joking, I miss... the gone me, the gone. The person that has gone, oh, I miss him. To this person, I am st I don't... My wife has to force me to shave in the mornings, you know, because I have big beards, massive hair, because I can't look in the mirror, because I hate the person that I see. And I'm very hard on myself. I'm very hard on myself, you know. But I take every day as it comes. I, st I, I still get up at four in the morning. I go training. You know, I go to work for nine hours. I come home. I pack my stuff for the next day. And, it's re and some days I think it's eat, sleep, repeat, train, eat, sleep, repeat, train, work, this... And it gets monotonous. But I've got a strong person behind me, you know, and she pushes me forward all the time. When did you feel as if you started losing who you were? Was it after you started doing your missions and killing people or was that... When I got blown up? Was that when everything kind of... Tr a trigger point for everything for you? Do you remember that ice wall I mentioned? Yeah. That's when it shattered. That, that shattered me. When and was that? It, um... Believe it or not, it's my last Afghan tour, and it was probably four, five weeks into the tour. I hit a 30 kilo anti tank mine in my vehicle. I broke both my arms, gave me a brain injury. I get migraines and all that. My hips are knackered. Um, yeah. And this is the strength of the army, you know, they had me in cast for six weeks. My, I couldn't even wipe my own ass. I had to rely on Tanya to do everything. And I was all out out for six weeks. They took the casts off, you know. And you, you feel a bit free with it. And then they made me do 10 press-ups and they sent me back out to make sure my arms were strong enough. Sent you back out? They to, sent me back to out. Work. Yeah. And I... And... Um, yeah, I was doing more missions... I didn't feel right in my head. Didn't feel right. Is that when the thing started? Do you feel as if you'd, you'd become a different person from the kid that you were yeah. 10, 20 years ago? Yeah. I was um, more quiet, angry, never rang Tanya, never spoke to her, never wrote to her. Why? I don't know why. Just, you just want to be on your own. You know, and I never really spoke to anyone really um, until 
all the death threats started happening after the tour and I spoke to the MO medical officer and I was going, I'm in shit state, I'm broken, I'm broken. And that's when the ball started rolling and I was doing exercises after the tour, you go on exercise after and um, you do low level training. But I was fighting in them exercises like I was still in Afghan. You know, that like one of the squadrons would be the enemy and you're fucking cable tying them, you're pushing them around, you go, get that far. You, you, you're going over the top instead of being low level. And I couldn't picture, I couldn't separate it. Is that because you were in so much conflict for years that yeah. you were just so used to it? There's part of you so conditioned to that that you actually miss it, Craig? I miss it to this day now. It's been eight years. If somebody phoned you around and says, look, we've got a oh, job yeah. for you. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Without, <laughs> doubt. without <laughs> doubt. If China kicked off now and they, yeah. they, they, they wanted people under under 50 to rejoin, I'm mm. fucking, I'm at the front of the queue. Without a doubt. Even though you know how much it's destroyed you mentally and, and that you're just willing to, is that, that, what is that then, adrenaline? Is it freedom? What is it you're, you're battling? Like, what is that feeling then? That your it's, euphoria, what, how, what is it? It's knowing what I'm doing. Yeah, you, you feel as if you've got a purpose. Yeah. Do you not? It, it's like when you leave. <clears throat> I work in a job now. I won't tell you what it is, but I work in a job now, and I'm, I'm happy in that job, and they treat me well at the job, you know, and they're aware of my ailments, and they give me extra time to rest and stuff like that. If I have a really shit day, they're really good, really kind people. If I didn't have that, that Pacific job, can you imagine me working in Tesco's or Asda or Sainsbury's, just going down there and saying, yeah, what'd you do? I was a sniper. Sniper for 16 years. Oh, I think you ever qualified for uh, stacking shells. Why am I? You know? And um, funny enough, I spoke to a gentleman in America um, last week. And he said that the majority of Special Forces guys have trouble finding employment in America, Delta Force, Navy SEALs, because that's all they've done all their life. And they've got nothing on their CV. I've got nothing on my CV, yet I'm just a sniper. I was in the household cavalry for so many years, I'm a sniper. That's it, big blank space to where I am now, you know. Protecting people, though, like saving lives and <clears throat> like. What you've done, man, is second to none. It's, it's admirable and it's admirable. Uh, but ad, what's that word? Abr Ambr admiral. Am admiral. And uh, but what you've achieved, like uh, fucking, I'm blown away by your story and what you've actually went through. Like, I know wars and conflicts. But if the world was a great place, there wouldn't be any. But there is somebody needs to protect people, and, and you were that guy at the forefront to do that. Like, it's unbelievable what you've actually went through and. It's um, it's scary what you actually have to battle coming out as well. Like, how long did you serve? Twenty three years. And after that, it was just a case of it was half an hour and to say, right, you've done your job, thanks, off you go. Yeah, not allowed back in the regiment. You get put onto like uh, where wounded soldiers go, and you just get wait for your discharge. Why did you get discharged? PT PTSD, severe PTSD, adjustment disorder, um, brain injury. Hips. Just couldn't focus anymore. More PTSD, more than anything else. Did you want to stay in? Yeah. Yeah, I would have thought. But I think you can only go a certain distance. There would be one point in my life where I'd have had to leave the army. You know what I mean? But I think I'd be happier serving my time knowing I'd done my full time. Like 20, 22 years is the time that you do. But I'd done 23 because I was getting discharged at the time. So I would have been discharged at the army at some point anyway, but it was just a fact of how it went around doing it, you know. I remember watching the film American Sniper. You just remind me of that man. That, nice guy. Yeah. A really nice guy. You met him? Yeah, I have, yeah. I met him in America. But that film is basically based on you as well, eh? Did you watch that film and see a lot I of your... I've never, never watched it. Why? Because they bring back a lot of memories? Yeah, or? I can't really watch war films. I'm either... Oh. I'm either correcting them <laughs> or I just can't watch it. Yeah. I find things yeah. emotional. I cry. I cry the Lloyd's Bank advert, the horse. You know, I cry 
when I see the RSPCA adverts on telly, I when when I see a comedy show and somebody's serious on it, I start crying. And that, that, it's weird. You just can't control your emotions. When did that start? When I got blown up. So it's all stemmed from then? Yeah. Do you think it just opened up a doorway of... Massively. ...that you've blocked out for so long? Yeah, all the tools, all the stuff that I've seen, the, this wall, this ice wall's been holding it all back and I've just been cracking on, you know. And now I'm... Now I'm forced to wear a mask. I won't say forced, but I wear a mask because I I believe, uh, this is how I think, that you infect people with your misery. So people just, you don't want to be around sad people. The only time I take it off is when I'm at home and my wife sees it and she understands, you know. And it's good because my wife, when I say I'm sad or depressed, my wife went for a bout of depression um, for a few months and she says to me now I know what it feels like Greg I know it probably not to the extent but I know what it feels like to be sad to be depressed and it's nice to have that understanding you know yeah because we've all had moments of depression like I've had my depression as well where I've done everything to block it out from drinking drugs externally but I'd imagine like everybody's Levels of depression are different. Now, hearing your stories, I think, like, fuck me, like, it's understandable that what you bought and what you went through, like, and then with your wife being there as well, your sidekick to then help you and understand to be there, and somebody needs that rock, to a shoulder to cry on, mm -hmm. basically. Now you say you're emotional, but that's a sense of relief as well. You'll probably feel a bit better after a good cry, but... When you got discharged, what happened? What was your life like then? Did you feel used? Were you just a pawn in a game? Or did you feel angry? Or did you think, do you know what? It was time. It was just a number. All you are is a number. As soon as you leave that regiment, something else takes your place. And you're just a number. And then you leave the army and you feel lost. You do feel lost. I miss it. Eight years and I still miss it to this day now. I still fucking miss it. People daydream. You know when people daydream and they daydream about holidays they've been on or holidays are going to go on? I daydream and dream about the shit stuff. That's what I daydream about. Scarred for the army. But yeah, I still miss it so much. Do you feel as if you're in a more of a war zone now than you were when you were actually in a war zone? It's different. A different war. This is a mental war. More than a physical war. You know? But it's like... Um, going to say forgot oh yeah about um, about civilian PTSD to an army PTSD I can never work it out when somebody says oh yeah I'll be, I got run over by a car now I've got PTSD in my head I couldn't call, you know I couldn't work it out and go what you got over by a car and you got PTSD I got fucking PTSD. I'm the fucking one that should be fucking. It took me a long time to think, hang on a minute. Yeah, fair one. You probably have hit by a car. Do you understand what I mean? And, and it took me a long time to learn the comparisons against both of them. Yeah. Like I say, it's, it's levels to it, but depression is depression. Like everybody's sees the world differently and has been through more different levels of trauma yeah yeah which is scary do you have people to talk to craig do like people you can rely on and trust and open up fully and and let it out or is you, you just feel do you still feel alone yeah very much so i try to i try to go to organizations to charities to stuff like that and um if you've got complex ptsd adjustment disorder and other stuff wrong with you these charities are useless these charities only give you six sittings. So you have six appointments to go to and then you're done. You can't have any more appointments and you have to apply within six months or a couple of, couple of months' time to go and see them again. But in that couple of months' time, you could be strung up in a tree somewhere, you know. See what you're battling now? Does part of you ever feel like you wish you would have died on to her? Yeah. Yeah. I wish I lost a limb or something. It sounds horrible, but people can't see the mental health in me. But when you say, yeah, I got blown up, they automatically look you up and down to make sure if you've got all your limbs on you. You know, I'd rather lost my limbs than have mental health issues. 
Was there not a time you phoned your missus as well because you thought you were going to die? Yeah. Where yeah, was I, that? Um, I went to a place, um, it's called the Pijok in Iraq. And basically this, this outbuilding was only ran by about, um, say, 18 blokes. And um, they were, we were guards in the prison. And from 11 o'clock at night till 5 o'clock in the morning, the fucking gates of hell would open and they would come from everywhere. They'd be like monkeys. They'd be just piling up, running everything. Got to the point where one day, one night, it was overrun. And we were getting overrun from north, west, east, south, everything. They were coming from everywhere. And it got so bad, we were pissing on the barrels of the machine guns, the jimpies, because they were getting so hot. We were pissing on the barrels, trying to cool them down. We were using, um, we ran out of gun oil. So we started using cooking oil to, to fucking lube them up, stuff like that. And I remember when you're on tour, you have a sat phone to ring you paradigm phone it's called and you have it um and you get a little card with a number on it and you get a certain amount of minutes each month you get a new one and you just type in the number because you have eight minutes left and then you can ring your missus and where the sniper hide was when me and my mate were the, the phone was just down there like it was red like the bat phone and um we were we were getting yeah we were getting smashed and um, I climbed down and I phoned her up and I said, I love you. She goes, yeah, I know. She goes, I love you too. She goes, everything's all right. Everything's all right. And I said to her, I'll ring you in the morning. I promise you I'll ring you in the morning. She was going, you're all right. Everything's fine. She goes, what's all that noise? It's a bit of drama at the moment, I said. Everything's fine. And then I put the phone down. And I rang her in the morning. See, when you go through that, was, was there ever a time that, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it all up and try and make a life worth my wife? Or was you just so in it that you couldn't leave? It was always army first, Tanya second always and even if she would say that it was always army first every course that I'd done I'd try and get top student all the courses that I try to do because I wanted to strive to be better you know and I put people who go a mile to you know to do good coursework to do this I'll do 20 fucking miles try and strive even to be better you know and we tried for children we tried for kids, but it never worked. IVF, stuff like that, we tried and never worked for us. And Tanya said, it, I think it's a blessing for what you're going through now. I doubt if we'd have coped with a child, to be honest with you. Yeah. Because I remember a story years ago that a soldier was in Headley Court, and it's where all the wounded soldiers go. And um, it's where Help the Hero started from. And he was begging them not to let him go home, not let him go home. He can't go home. He can't go home. And they said, you're fine. There's nothing wrong. You've got PTSD. you got this. Everything's fine. You need to go home. He went home and shook his baby to death. And that sticks with me, that story does. You know? And that's when Tanya said it's, it's a blessing, probably, that we never had a child. Yeah, so do you, f you even feel and think that sometimes, like, what can go wrong? So every day is a battle to try and stay sane, yeah. even though you probably feel as if you're going insane. Yeah, and that's where the mask comes in. Mm -hmm. Where beyond that mask, you're screaming. But you just take it off and you put it on and you're nice and happy and people accept you for who you are. Have you ever tried to take your own life, Craig? Yes, I have. Yeah. Um Try to shoot myself in America. My wife went back to England, and um, I got a uh, Heckler Cock forty five, big old gun, and um, took all the rounds out of it. And I was just practicing where I'd pull it, 
my head, my mouth, my eye socket, and I put it so far in my mouth, I was choking on it, gagging on it, because I just wanted to fucking do it, and I was practicing, just clicking it, clicking it. And I put one round in, cocked it, uh, put it in my mouth, and remember his saliva was coming out, and I was just, and my dog looked at me, Betsy, and she was moving her head back and forth, and I was just staring at her for ages. And I just pulled the trigger back and see the hammer going back. And I stopped. And I believe she saved my life. Yeah. And then there's been other times. Thinking out, why can't I do it? Why can these people do it and I can't? Am I a coward? Am I... Why? Why can't I? I used to scream. Why can't I fucking do it? Why? I'm hurting. I'm in fucking pain. Why can't I fucking do it? I just don't know. Just don't know. I know one reason that I said before, somebody's got to find you. Yeah, but then you've got to look at the missus who's there to support you, your dog. You don't you don't really think of them at the time. Yeah. You don't. There's no consideration there for them. First one to say that. There's no consideration at the time. I've a rope, pills, you know, a gun. Yeah, there's no no consideration. You just want it for yourself. You just want to be free of that pain. But you're clearly here for a reason, brother. Like the amount of people who message you for help and inspiration and you're clearly a fighter. You always strive to be the best in everything you've ever done. You've been the best. The pain that you're going through, I'd imagine there's not many people's has went through what you've went through and seen what you've seen and done what you've done to then be still sitting here and still being open and honest about how you're feeling. You feel like fucking ending it. You feel like going crazy. You feel like going back into a war zone because that's where you'll find your peace. Like, it's mad to what you've went through, but you're still here. Like, the messages you'll receive, like, this interview will fucking change lives, brother. Like, I do a lot of homeless work back in Glasgow and the majority of men on the street are veterans. And it's sad to think that they're willing to fight and die for their country, but then nobody's willing to fight and die for them when they come back and they've got fucking nobody mm. like it's heartbreaking that like people can like my granders and stuff great granders were in world war twos and stuff and listen as much as we'd love to think we want peace in this world somebody has to do these jobs and like, i love my great granddad a bits man for the few years that i met him but he really struggled back then with alcohol and stuff but like, you're not you've not went down that route of getting drunk and trying to get angry you're just trying to fight the pain of trying to become a better person, understand what you've done and trying to quiet your mind. And it's a lot to put on, man. It's a lot of pressure on yourself consistently what you you do, not you think that you're good enough and you could have done more, but better and done this and that. But this is what you've done, brother, and it's trying to kick on and trying to, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm speechless of your story, brother. Like, and that's not normal for me. Usually I'm fucking gift of the gab, but for what you've went through, I don't know if there's many people that can make you feel at ease for what you've achieved and what you've done, but like I say, you're still here to tell the tale and people who will be watching this will be thinking, fuck me, like, it's unbelievable what you've actually went through and still been here to tell the tale. Like, telling your story, I'd imagine it brings back a lot of emotions for yourself. Yeah. It, it, I'd love to take a few minutes after this just to compose myself you know because yeah. it brings back a lot of stuff only f like talking about it only feels like yesterday <clears throat> I left only feels like yesterday you know I think also it's a camaraderie you miss the brotherhood oh without a doubt without a doubt still now people whatsapp me from the past only a word message here and there, and don't speak to them for a few months after that, and then, and then again a little message. They never end, you know. It's camaraderie, it's, it's brotherhood. What comes close to when you feel you're happiest? When I feel happy. Yeah, now. 
I'm not happy. 24-7? Yeah. Sad. I, I had a week of bliss three weeks ago. I thought, fucking hell, I feel pretty good. And Tanya said to me, she goes, you seem different. I was going, yeah, I feel different this week. I feel, I feel all right. I want to saw my therapist and I sat there and it's for an hour. And I said to him, I goes, what's, he goes, I feel, I feel pretty good this week. You know? And he went, okay, talk me about it. So I talked to him about it. And the session last half an hour and I thought, I've got nothing fucking more to say. I feel okay. You know? And do you know what? It hits you twice as fucking harder the next week and the week after that and then this week. Twice as harder. Do you think that's why then you're maybe scared to be happy because you think you shouldn't be happy and you know there'll be a come down after it? Probably. It's not. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But you are allowed to be happy, brother. I know you are. You are allowed to be happy. You are allowed but to make think a new I've chapter. Got, I've got thoughts in my head. I've got this voice in my head. I've got this, I've got that. I suppose Tanya makes me smile. When I see her. She makes me smile. But happiness, I've been happy for a long time. I think I'm in that rut because I haven't been happy for a long time. I'm just stuck in that gutter going along, you know, taking every day as it comes. Yeah, you don't know what it really feels like to be happy anymore. Like you said, you lost that connection to who you used to be, the guy who used to laugh and joke. But for what you've done and what you've went through, like it's understandable. But you, you're identifying with it that you can make adjustments. You're identifying that you had that burst of happiness and it's made you feel sad. I, I believe happiness isn't a 24-7 thing anyway. It's, you get a little burst that when you exercise and stuff, because I know you train hard, you're a big fucking unit, like at 4 a.m., do you not feel, how do you feel after a good session in the gym? Gives me about half an hour of euphoria, mm -hmm. happiness, I think. It's contradiction, really. I, like I spoke to my, uh, I, I talk about my therapist because I really talk to him about stuff. You know, and, and I said, some days I sit here and I'm very contradicting. I contradict myself. Like, there's me saying I'm never happy. But then after the gym, after a good workout, I feel, fucking, I feel all right. But it doesn't last long. So I might as well take that as that half hour and then the rest of the day just fucking miserable. So that half hour gets deleted out, if you know what I mean. Uh, so it doesn't really fucking count. Do you feel guilty if you're happy? Yeah, I think, yeah, there's stuff that I need to sort out in my head before I can be happy. But you're willing to work at it. You're that therapist, you're taking medication, you're doing things to try and find something. But you get tired of it. Do you, you, get get, you get tired of taking medication. You get tired of seeing a therapist, you know. And I... I pay a therapist out of my own pocket because these charities are no good. And then I think to myself, I've been seeing him for three years now. Is it three years? Yeah, three years ago. I've been three years back in the UK. And then I, and then I, um, some days I feel well, I can't afford him this month. I can't afford it this month, but you know, but. Yeah, you end up still going, don't you? Is that where you feel let down then for everything that you've done, Craig, to then being kind of shot on? Like Massive, massively. And these charities, they go, yeah, we help you. Like <clears throat> Combat Stress has offered to, and I'll drop a name, drop the name bomb. They've offered to take me on. And I said to my therapist, that'd be gleaming. Yeah, because they got massive windows of opportunity for everything. Yeah, they give me six sessions. And then what? That'd be it. Six sessions you get. Okay. So I've left my therapist. I've been seeing for three years to come here for six sessions. For what? And I still feel the fucking exactly the fucking same. 
you know yeah there's one organization i went to go to i just used to sit there with a the woman i go what am i here for i'm just sitting here it's because i want you to talk well, you're the therapist yeah just use it, does it make you angry yeah made very very fucking angry there was a famous picture famous picture um which I've got, I'll show you later. Um, members of Parliament, Parliament it was. You know the famous picture with the green seats all down the side. You've got the, you got the speaker down the front. Packed. Standing room only. It is absolutely fucking packed. You could not sit down. Standing room only. What do you reckon? MP's wages. And there's the next picture next to it with four people. Suicide with veterans. That hit home. That hits home. That nobody fucking cares. No one cares. No one cares. And they say they do things. They say they do that. They say they do that. They don't follow it up. They don't follow it up. Not at all. Is that why it's been so hard over the last few years when you've been discharged? Yeah, massively. What do you think should be put in place, Craig, for veterans and people who served their country? Housing stuff like that for veterans especially the homeless people like um help them more give them more opportunities job opportunities and there's the, i remember i spoke to this lady and she said there is a company out there that gives veterans jobs i said oh brilliant and then i heard about as soon as they hire me if they hired me and i think gleaming I'm, i've got a job now i'm stacking shelves brilliant love to it and one day I have a wobble and they can't handle it, I'm out of my ear. Or I'll take a sick day because I'm depressed. I'm out of my ear. You know, yeah. they say they do things and then the, on the flip side, when everything goes quiet, pff, they put you off to the sideline. Yeah. All the time. So you just feel used that yeah. 23 years of fighting for your country, saving lives and try to do what you'll do to then see you later. There's nothing out there. I don't... There's nothing out there. And many people build things up and do things like have a weekend away. That's only a weekend, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's only a weekend of being free. You've got to go back to your normal life, haven't you? Yeah. It's just it's sad to think that. Like we spoke earlier about the homelessness, like veterans, man, guys who have willing to die and help people and try to save lives to then <clears throat> being shot on. Yeah. Which is sad. Is it, did it make... Do you have any regrets from doing what you've done, Sniper? Do you wish you'd never done it or would you, would you, wouldn't you change anything? I wouldn't have changed anything. I'd have put a point with myself in a different situation instead of getting blown up. So I've still got the ice wall, you know. I wouldn't have done what I'd done, but I made the decision and I went with it. Yeah. What about when you, you wrote a book? I did, yeah, The Longest yeah, yeah, Kill. The Longest Kill. And uh, how was that for you? Because I know a lot of people write books and they feel as if it's therapy. I wrote it just to um, put people right because my shot, they had me lying down, they had me doing this, they had me mm. things. I just wanted to put them right about the shot, but I just couldn't put one chapter in. So I had to write about my life, you know? And then, um, yeah, it, it worked out all right. Yeah, it was, it was good writing. I wrote another book. And this other book's about my mental health. I write in a book, mm -hmm. um, and it's a leather binder. Tanya got it me, and it's got a lock on it. And in that book, there's the most vilest things that I think about, horrible things. It is a fucking book. And I got pages of that in there. I've got pages of my mental health, everything, what soldiers go through. No one to touch it. No one to touch it because it's too... It's to the bone, you know. But that's um, the truth of what people actually go. It is the truth, go. but no, no one will touch it because it's it's to the truth. Yeah. You know, no one wants to know about <clears throat> that person who's close to suicide. And the thoughts that they're having. Yeah. Has nobody ever contacted you to turn your life into a film? No. I, no, I lie, actually. I had one guy reach out on my Instagram. Um, he said he ever done a, um, a film uh, screenplay on it I said no never never it should be a film it should be out there far and wide but yeah your lad by one of you was 7 million views in just a few months that's mm. unbelievable like the raw emotion of what you actually go through people think Sniper 
me personally, I don't know a sniper, but prior to meeting you, I thought that would be a cool job, having a gun fucking in the army, shooting people, and you think, cool. But now you know the extent to actually fuck me, like what you've went through and the battles that you're going through is is tough and you wouldn't wish that upon your worst enemy. Like what you have to battle mm-hmm. fucking every day, Craig. Like it's unbelievable. Like nobody sees that. Nobody sees the guys at the forefront who are risking their life every day, leaving their family and doing what they do. Like it's you take your hat off to these guys, it's inspirational that like they're willing to sacrifice their life to try and protect others. But then the sad thing is nobody's there to risk their own life to protect them when they come back. That's no. the fucking heartbreaking yeah. thing. That's where you can see why you'll be angry at all, at all that what what the fuck am I going to do now? You're just kind of left out in limbo to figure it out on your own. Do you feel as if that's where you thrive more though when you're alone and you can try and figure it out and sort it out or do you think you can't sort it out? Some days I feel I can't sort it out mm-hmm. and then I have to speak to Tanya. I have to reach out to her. Even when she's working, she a little part-time job. She's there, you know, when I'm screaming and shouting and making no sense on the phone because I can't breathe because I'm such in a fucking state. You know, she she calms me down. But there's other times where I like being on my own. I like going to the woods, sitting there and just contemplating, doing stuff, doing stuff with my hands, flint napping. I like flint napping. I like making spoons. I like doing weird things with wood, you know. But, yeah, I like being on my own. Um, How's the response been for you after the Land Bible interview? Overwhelming. Overwhelming. I started off with an Instagram page with just a 1,000 followers, you know. It's gone up to, is it 9,740 at the moment, followers. And I spoke to every single one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because Tanya said that's important. Every time somebody messaged me or messaged me back, and they can't believe it. They're going, oh my God, I can't believe you just messaged me. Oh, um, and they, they just ramble on. And mm-hmm. I just put a thumbs up or I go, <laughs> you know, thanks for your kind message. It means yeah. a lot to me, mate. You know, thanks for that. Does that make you feel a little bit better like, understanding that you, you then become an inspiration for people to give them light? Because a lot of people, it's hard to say that there's levels. Of, obviously, there's different levels of trauma, but what you've actually been through, what you've actually witnessed, what you've actually let's like seen with your own eyes like <clears throat> then people will go fuck me like he's still here to tell the tale so it gives other people hope that you're still here battling and you're being fucking truly open and honest about your battles and struggles which is so important like a big strong man for yourself you've seen you walking along the street you'd think fuck me he's a strong guy like probably wouldn't think anything but then when you actually sit down with you and get to know your story you think wow but people don't know what people yeah. are battling internally but when people are reaching out to you does it make you understand okay i have got a purpose that I can then help other people see the world differently and push on when you're struggling? I, d- I, d- I didn't want it to overwhelm me mm-hmm. with all these messages, but it does overwhelm you and you feel that you have to, yeah, you have to, you have to answer them, you have to respond to them. And but I segregate it. I segregate my problems with helping others. You know, it's like if you had a problem, I'd help you deal with it. I'll square away. But in a way, I've got a mask on and because I'm dealing with my own problems and beyond now I'm screaming, you know, when, and when I've separated from you and gone, we sorted? Yeah, oh, thanks, Craig. Thanks for doing that. Brilliant. Walk away. I've still got my issues. I've still got my problems, you know. Do you feel as if you've been constantly helping everybody, though, more than actually trying to help yourself over the last 20 years? Which is good. Which yeah. is good because it takes me off that suicide roller coaster, you know, it takes me off that um, thinking of the thoughts that I have all the time. What's your plans for the future then, Craig, for moving forward? I've opened a survival school called Maverick Survival. Um, it's on, it's got a website up and going. So just uh, what's that about? Do you know what? It's about getting away. Um, I said about getting away for the weekend. It's you haven't got your problems. You still got your problems, but to get away. And having that respite from stress and everything is the way forward. And everything's provided for you. I've paid for everything. You know, I've got a wood block. I've got 57 acres to hand. And you just go there. We make spoons, mallets. We skin um, trout. We eat trout. 
make your own meals, you know, we go tracking, foraging, everything to do with survival school. We do axe work and stuff like that. Then we do a bit of flint napping. I've just bought a little forge that you can make um, our heads out of um, nails and stuff like that. So everything's all hands on. And you just, so you forget, you forget. And then my therapist, Ross, he said, if you've got anyone with dramas, he comes down the second night and he talks to him, you know? So there was always a, a lean post there mm -hmm. for him as well. And once they've gone, I'm not saying goodbye to them. I'm actually saying we're mates. Yeah. Stay in contact. Mm -hmm. And do you know what? 9,740, 9, 9, I'm still in contact with them all. So. But that's amazing then. That people are coming to do those things and it'll be taking them away and helping them. But that's an amazing thing to do. Mm -hmm. How can people get involved with it? There's the website and stuff. Just do the website's up and running. Just mm -hmm. go on the website and there's different dates. Um, pick a date, email me. And then um, we'll, we'll have a chat and figure out payment and stuff like that. And then yeah. you come down. It's shut down at the moment because I'm having a, di a double hip replacement in November. Mm. So um, but it'll be open again in the new year. But um, but you can still book and uh, prior, you know, in advance. Yeah. Do you think that's a little added pressure on you because you're getting a hip replacement, you know, you're not able to train and stuff? Yeah, I, I, I worry about my mental health because obviously training is a big thing for me. Since I was joined the army, train, 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 you know, and then getting my hips done is going to be a big thing. But my therapist said he'll come around my house, which is beyond and mm -hmm. his, his, what he does, but he say we can sort stuff out. Which is good. Yeah, but that shows you that you have got great people around you then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like you have got something in it, but this thing that people can... But you cut. get blinded by it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Depression, PTSD, the sadness. Yeah. It overwhelms you. It comes over you. I always say if you had a duvet cover on the floor, one was black and one was white. And the white one was happiness, you know, everything to do with... God knows what, you know, bring light into your life. Mm -hmm. And the black one is depression, darkness, evil, suicide. And you pick that duvet up and you throw it over yourself and it's black inside and you can't see anything. That's what depression, that's what sadness yeah. is, you know. And you can take it off, but no one's going to throw that white one on you. Mm -hmm. Keep throwing that black one on you. And that's what it feels like. Yeah, because you went through an operation as well a few weeks ago with a finger. Yeah, I'm a finger yeah, amputated. Well, what, why, what happened? Uh, when I got blown up, I contracted a disease in my hand. And it just got worse and worse and worse to the point where my hand was like that. So I just decided to cut the finger off to give me that release so I can still use it. Feel better for that? It's still sensitive. I've got a trapped nerve in the scar. So, but yeah, my wife hates it. Plus, yeah. yeah, it's my wedding ring finger. <laughs> so it's even worse. Yeah. So see when you before we finish up, Seal, you were on a mission. What food and stuff were you eating? Rations, normal rations. But you end up eating um the they call them dog biscuits, you know, the uh, biscuit browns mm -hmm. and the fruit biscuits, because they clog you up. They're designed to make you constipated. So if I ate rations all the time, like boiling the bags, I'll be shitting all the time. So the best thing is just to eat the biscuits to tick you over. What's the long time longest you've waited for to take a shot? Uh, probably seventy two hours. What? Yeah. Do you feel bloated or anything? Or yeah, feel... a little bit uncomfortable. A bit uncomfortable. It's like giving birth. <laughs> if birth was like giving that. <laughs> yeah. But for anybody watching just now, brother, that's maybe struggling and battling and they think that f they want to throw themselves off the fucking roof, like, what advice would you give for them? Talk. Talk Talk to yourself. Talk to someone, you know. I battle it, and at the end of the day, it's, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. You need to talk to someone, you know, or reach out to me on my Instagram and I'll talk to you. You know, by all means, I've got time. If you ring me at 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, I'll pick up that phone and I'll talk to you. That shows you your kind of character that you are, that you're still battling, but still willing to help other people, brother. That. I just don't like people suffering. I'd rather suffer for them than watch people suffer. Let's go through the pain. They're going through. I'd rather get and then go, 
right, you're done. I've, I've got it in me. I've got it in me because I'm strong enough to do it. That just shows you your character, though. Do you feel as if you're always trying to take everybody else's pain away and you're, you, that's exactly what you're doing? Is it clogging it? Is it holding on to everybody's pain that you've always tried to be the leader? That everybody's came to you and you've took away all their pain yeah. and tried to, well, you've suppressed it all. Do you know what I mean? Like for you, even going through your battles and then still wanting to help other people just shows you the kind of guy that you are. And listen, it's been an absolute honour to meet you today and for you coming on and telling your story and laying it on the line. This will help people and fucking mass numbers and you i don't know if you understand that that how important this is today that to show people what you go through what you're battling yet you're still here you've been totally honest about your demons the problems that you're going through and but the, the amazing thing is that you're still willing to help people but for coming on today brother i'm telling your no story worries. i thoroughly enjoyed it man you're yeah. a true inspiration and you should be proud of everything you've done brother thank you for having me god bless you and i look thank forward you. to see what you do for the future no worries. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.